Welcome everyone to the L7C podcast. Today we have a very special episode for you all today. We have the return of the queen of the L7C, Dr. Chelsea Police. How are you doing today, ma'am? I am doing well. You know, happy to be back. It's been a while. It has been a while. I think the last time we spoke, Megan Rapino and Draymond Green were about to fight. Yeah, I think I think that's right. So just for like all your fans out there at the United States and across the world, what's been up, where you've been and what's going on? Yeah, so as you know, I graduated with my PhD in May, um, and then that's when things got a little bit crazy. So was on the job market during that time and was interviewing, doing all that stuff, finally got an offer. And so I had to pack up and and move my life within a three-week period of time. So that's kind of what's what's been going on. Uh, Moved from Louisville to Oxford, Ohio. Um, and then started a new job, which has been incredible, but it's also been crazy, crazy, crazy. We're getting ready to wrap up the semester in a couple of weeks. It's absolutely flown by, but it's been an incredible experience. I love it so, so much, um, but I'm definitely happy to be back now that I'm a little bit more settled and, and have some additional free time to, to come back and, and talk to everyone. So what's it like being now on a full-time? professor like what's the differences from what you obviously like you were having homework and dissertations and all that stuff but like was the transition smooth from what you were doing to graduate to now just being full-time you're not getting you're not doing homework you're grading homework like how is that transition it's been crazy uh it's been interesting to say the least so i went from teaching two classes to now i'm teaching four classes which is just insanity. I teach more than 10 hours a week, four days a week. Um, So just really, really hectic, but my students are incredible. And I just really, really like the campus and and where I am in the department I'm in. So that transition is crazy, but it's been phenomenal. And I can't see myself anywhere else as of right now where I am in my life. And it's, it's just been really great. I I have so many good things to say. It's it's really hard to put into words. Since you had to pack up and basically leave in like a three weeks, months time, I know some companies when you have to move, they'll try and like help, like alleviate some costs or pay you a little bit more. Do universities do that? Or were you just SOL and trying to find a place, all that within three weeks? So they do give some moving expenses and it really depends on the university. So, you know, some will, some will offer more than others. It just really, really depends. So I did get a little bit of help and, and my colleagues in in the department were more than willing to like recommend realtors and different people to talk to, give me kind of a lay of the land and and what to expect in, in and out of um, Oxford. So it, it made things a lot easier. And and let me tell you, we bought a house in a two week period of time, which was absolutely insane. Would I do it again? Probably not. But, you know, we had to do what we had to do. And it ended up working out really, really well. So were you are you the newest professor on your guys' staff or did other people come as well? Yeah, so I am one of two new hires this year. My position is a permanent position, and then the other hire is what's called a visiting assistant professor. And so that role is like a five year maximum, whereas mine is permanent. So as long as I want to stay in the role and I'm doing a good job, my position won't be eliminated and or somebody else won't have to fill it after that five year period. So earlier you talked about like the classes you're teaching and the hours and all that. And since you were new, do they pick the classes you're teaching or do you get to be the professor of the stuff that you are like an expert in? How does that work? Yeah. So I did not get to pick what classes I wanted to teach this semester, actually, or next semester either, simply because they needed to fill whatever classes they needed. So who the person that I basically took their position. They were a visiting assistant and then they got a permanent line. That's what we call jobs, our, our lines. And so 
whatever that person was teaching prior is what I ended up teaching this semester. Um, so I'm teaching a sport marketing class and I'm teaching facilities and event management in sport, two classes I've never taught before. And I'll be teaching both of those next semester along with a sport econ class, which the econ class I'm actually really excited about. I have an econ minor while I was an undergrad student. So it's something that I have interest in and, and we'll see how it goes. But yeah, this semester didn't get to choose. Next semester didn't get to choose. But hopefully next semester I'll have a little bit more say in what I teach. The nice thing is I have say in what time I teach, um, which oh. is unusual. Yeah. So I don't have to teach, you know, super early if I don't want to. And I don't have to t teach super late in the afternoon if I don't want to. So that's kind of nice. And, and I think that's something that's a little bit unique to universities because a lot of times the schedule is the schedule and you don't have a lot of say, especially with time. So you said there were some classes that you're teaching that you've never taught before. So like in a normal job, like when someone comes on, they might have some shadowing to see like how to do something. So with those classes, how do you prepare? Like, do you talk to a form like a colleague who's taught it before? Or do they just say, here's a class, make a lesson plan and go? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. And, you know, I've taken a sport marketing class and I've taken a facilities class as well. So I have a little bit of knowledge, but really, you know, it's it's about using textbooks, you know, using the Internet, see what resources you can find, talking to people who have taught the classes in the past. And my department's been really good about the transition and and helping me out, like giving me past syllabi, talking about past textbooks that they use, they've used and things like that. So it it really was incredibly helpful, but it's also really challenging. So I hate, you know, relying on the textbook when I'm teaching, but this semester I'm I'm certainly relying on it a lot more than I, I normally would, simply because, you know, I'm learning some of the material along with my students. And so it's better to be accurate about what you're saying than trying to, you know, kind of fake your way through it. And so for this semester, especially, it's it's really been a learning experience for me. And, and that's kind of the nice thing about teaching some of the same things in, in the following semester is you can make changes and you can adapt and make things a lot better as you go. And that's really kind of the art of teaching is, is being able to, to make those adjustments, understanding, you know, what worked, what didn't, and then being able to adapt so that your students are, you know, getting the most out of the material and what they need to learn without, you know, boring them to death with just, you know, lecture material, because I, I don't like to do that. I like to bring activities and different things into the fold as well. You get to decide your own like office hours as well. Yep. Well, it sounds like school and first year full-time professoring is going really well. So we hope that stays continue on do you or do they automatically put you on like a tenure track or how does that go so my position is not a traditional tenure track line so i'm in a like a teaching position so mm -hmm. i don't have to do research in my role whereas tenure track faculty have to teach and do research and but i still have an opportunity to, to promote within my own position so right now my official title is assistant teaching professor. And so I can still promote to the associate and to full professor over time, similar to a tenure track position, but it doesn't have the same kind of evaluation or uh, benchmarks that a tenure track does. Um, but I still have some of that job security in getting to promote and like contracts and, and things like that. So it's, it's, Tenure track without being traditionally tenure track, if that makes sense. Makes sense. Fair enough. Fair enough. So since it's been a while, there's just been a whole bunch of things that have happened in on the planet in regards to women, women in sports, just everything under the moon and sun. So with this one being your first one back in a minute, I just think we're just going to let you go and say what you want to say about what's been going on. And then we'll just go from there. Yeah, I think the the first thing that really pops in into my mind is what's been going on in the W N or NWSL. It's it's been a dumpster fire for lack of a better term. 
they, you know, are having record viewership numbers, but there's a massive problem from a culture perspective. So nine out of the 10 teams as of this past weekend have had coaching changes. Um, Many of the men who are in the league have been fired and or resigned due to allegations of abuse in different capacities. So verbal, even sexual, just really awful things. And, and more and more as these stories are coming out, it's, it's becoming really, really clear that there are people inside the NWSL who knew about these allegations. So for example, Paul Riley was with the Portland Thorns. And this is when he was accused of sexual coercion with some of his players, um, verbal abuse, things like that. There was an investigation. He was let go at Portland and then became the coach of the North Carolina Courage, where these allegations then came to light due to a some journalists um, brought it to light. Some of the former players who made the allegations talked with these journalists and it and it came to light and it was found out that the investigation had happened and somehow was let go of his job with Portland Thorns and somehow got a job with the North Carolina Courage. So that doesn't he make was, sense, but all right. Yeah. You know, ultimately they let him go at North Carolina Courage. Um and that kind of created this reckoning of, you know, who knew when How did he have a job still? You know, what's going on in the NWSL? And, you know, another coach, um, Burke, who was with the Washington Spirit, verbal abuse, racist allegations, things like that, also was forced to resign. Massive mess going on there. Um, The most recent allegations just came out past weekend with the Chicago Red Stars. Um, Allegations against their coach were brought forth as early as 2014 and most recently in 2018. Um, The crazy thing about this is they were just in the NWSL championship and the Red Stars created their press release for 1 a.m. on Sunday morning. So they released this information about the coach resigning following the NWSL championship. Later found out that there was a Washington Post article coming out about these allegations. So they let him save face and get out of the organization. So the NWSL is just in a position, they're at a crossroads. Let's just put it that way. Um, They have to figure out how they're going to protect their players, how they're going to implement things so that players don't face verbal, emotional, you know, sexual abuse in, in their roles as professional athletes. And it's just been, it's been a wild experience this year. And like I said, nine out of 10 teams are facing coaching, coaching changes. Coaches in the past have been problematic and still hired. And we see this a lot with male coaches. It's, it's what I call failing upward, right? So they get fired somewhere else. There's something problematic with them and yet they still land on their feet. And that's just not something that happens with women historically. Um, and so this is just something that's that's been weighing on me in terms of this organization love soccer, love women's soccer, but they really need to figure out what they're going to do moving forward and how they're going to address this so that this doesn't continue to happen. Because it's not just one team, it's multiple teams that are experiencing this. And so we've got to protect players. That's it. At the end of the day, you've got to protect your players. They are the foundation of the league. And without them, you don't have a league. Um, and we need professional soccer. We need women's soccer. And it just it's just been a crazy 10 months, I guess. So, okay, so break down the, so you, you said the nine out of the 10 head coaches. So just going from the coaches upward. So above the coach, we're talking the owners of the team, right? Yes. Okay. So then you go from the owners of the team to what? Who's above them besides like the commissioner or whoever's in charge? And uh, Who's below who's them a, or above them? Who's above the owners? Like who's running the league? Like the top person and who's the top boss of? So they have a commissioner and 
she so their actually their commissioner through most of 2021 resigned after the news of Paul Riley's okay. transgressions came out. It was made very clear that the league knew about this and didn't do anything mm-hmm. or didn't do anything to make sure that he did not get another job mm-hmm. after the situation. And you know, Alex Morgan was actually a big part of this. She encouraged her teammate to speak up about this, tell her story. And, you know, the commissioner came out and was like, we're really sorry. We didn't know. Why didn't we do more? We, you know, we would have done more. Well, Alex Morgan Morgan had receipts of this other player telling the league about what was going on, what happened. And so the commissioner then resigned. And so they now have an interim CEO for the NWSL. So I don't I don't know if that person's going to stay in that role through next year or if they're going to find somebody else. But their league structure is very interesting because U.S. soccer actually pays salaries for some of the players, namely the national team players. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very weird um, dynamic and not traditional for what we see with professional organizations simply because U.S. soccer is kind of subsidizing the league to some extent. They aren't doing that as much as they have in the past. And and the NWSL is really trying to become profitable so that they can get out from under U.S. soccer. And, And in some respects, you know, that makes sense. You want to be a standalone league. You want to show that you're profitable, that you can be a league on its own, but also, you know, those national team players are getting paid a lot more than your non-national team players. And it's going to be really hard for teams to sustain that without the help of, of U S soccer. So there's definitely some nuances with this particular professional league that we don't see with others. So I guess, and obviously help me out here, because I'm trying to figure out how the best way to go about it, like going forward would be. And if they have one, I don't know. Do, is there a task force in place where if something were to happen, they're they're not for or against the, the team or anyone, they're like there to get the troop. That's all they're supposed to do. Is there a task force in place? And if not, maybe that's something that I know you just said about the money that they need to invest some money in. Because me personally, I really don't like it that you have to go to a reporter for like stuff or tweet to get traction. Like, if you're a big organization like that with nationally known athletes, you should have your own tasks. Like there should be a task force where uh, if Alex Morgan, the t- like she encouraged her teammate, go to whoever the chief officer is and have people investigate it. It'll come up that way. Like there should be people there doing the investigations. That's just from a business organizational perspective. What do you think on that? Yeah. So after the Paul Riley situation, the league, U.S. soccer, and an outside maybe uh, attorney's office or law firm um, said they were going to do an independent investigation into the league, figure out how this all happened. But with the most recent situation with the Chicago Red Stars, evidently Kristen Press, another big name national team player, raised concerns about, you know, her abuse from the head coach to U.S. soccer and U.S. soccer said that it was fine. It was nothing and not to worry about it. So, you know, this, yeah. So it's, it's not just an NWSL issue. It's a U.S. soccer issue. Now it's a, an issue that, you know, how far down does this go? If, if our professional athletes are experiencing this, what's happening at the club or the grassroots level, and, and those are under U.S. soccer. So what does that look like? And, and, you know, there have been calls for investigations, not just at the NWSL, but for every club team that, you know, is under U.S. soccer, because it's it's not something that's strictly happening at the professional level. It's happening all over the place. And we really have to get to, you know, the bottom of it to understand how these coaches are are staying in these roles. You know, how, how do we identify when coaches are are crossing the line? 
what role do parents play in this? And so it's it's not just the NWSL, but it's also, you know, U.S. soccer is is culpable in this as well. And so, you know, they're really going to have to, you know, stay with these promises that they're going to investigate and do it independently because right. If us soccer is investigating themselves, what's going to happen. And that's, I equate this honestly to what we saw happen in, in gymnastics with USA gymnastics. And they still haven't done an independent investigation in, in that situation. So we still don't know what happened with that. We don't know who all was involved, who knew what, and who know who knew what, when, And so if we're going to learn from things like that, we need to start taking those steps or the league needs to take those steps to make sure that this doesn't happen and those people are not in the league anymore. So I think they're trying to figure out what's next in terms of a task force. The there is an NWSL Players Association and they have had some serious demands for the league. It sounds like as of the last update that all of those demands have been met as of, I think, last month. And so that did call for an independent investigation. It did call for um, investigations into, you know, all of the coaches or or understanding hiring practices and, and things like that. So there is some movement in the right direction, but whether or not that's going to rectify the situation, I don't know. I guess one of my other questions was this situation to relate it to a team we adopted throughout the year, the Atlanta Dream going to the WNBA and I saw and a whole bunch of like male NBA stars spoke out about that. What are the male soccer players saying about this situation? I guess I I honestly wouldn't be able to tell you the biggest name in the MLS since I'm just focused on the Columbus crew, but like, what are the big names in the MLS saying about this? Honestly, I haven't heard anything from any of them, but it could be also that I'm in a little bit of a vacuum because I don't really follow a lot of MLS players, don't really pay that close of attention to the MLS, um, simply because I, an MLS game isn't that exciting to me. I, mm-hmm. I mean, to be completely honest, I would rather watch European soccer. Um you know, and to be perfectly honest, I know a lot more European players than I do even U.S. players. Obviously support the U.S. men's national team, been watching them quite a bit with World Cup qualifying, things like that. But as far as, you know, seeing players actually speak out and talk about this, I haven't seen, you know, any of them supporting them or reaching out or making statements. You know, the last statement we saw from the men's national team was in solidarity solidarity with the women's national team about equal pay. But beyond that, uh, I haven't really seen anything with, with respect to the NWSL. Yeah. Cause I feel like, which is unfortunate because the big corporations, which sad, but statistically true, they only start to try and promote change. If one they're losing money, but you said at the beginning of this, that they're, they're making a record profit right now. So I don't know about record profit, but they've made. had really good viewership it's- numbers and like the NWSL championship, which was broadcasted on CBS, mm-hmm. had um, 525,000 viewers, which is um, a 200 percent increase from last year's final. So, so there's people that want to watch, obviously, and there were 10,000 people at the stadium watching in person. I was one of them. And I mean, it was a really, really cool environment. And it's really cool to see people excited about the NWSL and excited about the players. And, you know, they, the supporter sections and fans have come together to really rally behind the players and, and show their support, despite the turmoil that that's been just rampant over the last 10 months. Yeah, because if they're making money, they're like they would think it's not that big a deal. And the other thing is like if it's just terrible to say, but if one of the top male people spoke out about it and it caught more traction in the news and all of that, they might move a little bit quicker just because in history's past, that's what we've seen. 
uh, move the needle, which is, it sucks, but it is what it is at this point. But I think those things would be needed for them to actually really push on this. and Or, or they just, I don't know, or they just don't play. Because you brought up, like, if it's happening to the top athletes in the world in this profession, and then you go down, if I'm a, if you're a parent and you're seeing that and your daughter plays soccer, it's just like, well, if it's happening to people who play on the U.S. national team, I would think it could be happening to my daughter who's playing high school soccer or any of those things. Because it's like, if that's the culture that you're being brought up with, then the only way to make it, which would be terrible, but that's just things that need to change. Hell, if he wants redemption, that one guy who uh, talked about Trinity Rodman um if he wants redemption he can write a whole piece about it if he ever listens to any of these episodes since he was so famous for those 30 seconds but he can make his comeback fighting for fighting on this one so yeah well speaking of trinity rodman people are still referring to her as dennis rodman's daughter and now she is an nwsl champion so Erico. they still call her that yeah i saw a tweet just the other day that was like dennis rodman's daughter blah 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 and someone's like she has a name, you know, her Jesus. name's Trinity and, you know, it, it even came out. She said on Instagram, like she doesn't have much of a relationship with her dad. He was at their, not the final, he might've been at the final. I don't know, but it was the game before the finals to the semis mm -hmm. where she came out on Instagram and was like, you know, it was great that my dad was there, but you know, just so you know, I don't have much of a relationship with him. We've had, you know, a Rocky relationship in general and so you know just trying to be very honest about it and she's like i had mixed emotions about him being there was thrilled to see him but also it's just a you know touchy subject for lack of a better better term just because they don't have much of a relationship so you know i think that adds an additional kind of layer to this where you don't know these players on a personal level so you don't know how referring to her simply as Dennis Rodman's daughter would affect her. Like you don't know what that relationship is. And the fact that she even had to address that because people don't know, or people aren't respecting that she's her own person. And yes, she has a famous parent, but that doesn't, shouldn't mean anything or shouldn't, you know, affect her ability to be a pro professional athlete. And so you know, I think it's even more disrespectful for somebody to refer to her that way, even now knowing that you shouldn't do it anyway. But this, I think, adds an additional layer and an additional reason not to do it. It's not really even this isn't an excuse. It's not like her name's hard names Trinity. Yeah, it's not like it's 25 billion letters. It's Trinity, Trinity Robin, not that hard. You brought up gymnastics, so I, I'd be remiss to ask you since it was it was months ago. But what did you think of the whole twisties, Simone dropping out? I mean, because I know she was when we did that whole thing with the go to goats. That was one of the people you were super hot that ESPN did not put on that thing. So I know she's your girl. What did you think about that situation back then? Now, how things have changed? What did you think about it? Yeah, I mean. I absolutely heartbroken um i was devastated for her but i think it was incredible to watch her make the best decision for herself she doesn't have anything more to prove she has a record number of medals most of them gold she's not hardly been beaten ever and she wanted to do this for herself and unfortunately it just didn't work out the way she planned but what i loved most about her was the fact that she was there still supporting her teammates. She made that decision because she couldn't trust herself and she wasn't going to take the chance of, you know, competing, completely messing up and, and ruining her teammates' chances of getting any medal of any color. And so I think that's a huge gesture. I think it's a good understanding of yourself and what you can and can't do knowing your limits and so yeah it was incredibly heartbroken about the fact that she wasn't competing but I have a whole lot more respect for her even more than I did before because she was able to make that decision 
And, you know, the number of people who were giving her so much shit on social media because of this, like, Some you don't people under- still do. Yeah, still do. you calling her a quitter, you know, saying that she just gave up, like, are you a gymnast? Do you know what it's like to have the twisties? Do you go out every competition potentially where you could land on your neck and die? No, I don't think so. So I don't think you have any room to say or call her a quitter simply because she made a decision for herself. And what post Olympics, I I just love about her is that she has this carefree attitude. Now she's very confident in herself and what she does. And it's just been you know, incredible to see her grow. You know, she's only 24 years old. She's, you know, done so much for being simply 24 years old. And again, she doesn't have anything to prove to anybody. And so I just love that she made that decision for herself, but also factored in, you know, her teammates and knowing that she could potentially derail everything for them. And, you know, as a result of this, we saw SUNY you know, get the golden all or the all around. Um, you know, some of her other teammates were able to get a chance to compete that wouldn't have if Simone was in the competition. And so, you know, I'm a firm believer of everything happens for a reason. And while, you know, for her it was probably really disappointing. What I loved most when she was able to do the beam final, she was like, I am gonna love this um Brahms medal more than any of the other medals. I've won in the past. And I think that's great. I think she recognizes how important this was for her just from an individual perspective and, you know, F the haters for, you know, lack of a better term, I guess. Um, And then she went out and did a whole tour. She created this, this tour, which was incredible by the way, and just said F you to the haters. And I, and I love that about her. And she just, you know, if you don't follow her on social media, it's so fun to see her, you know, just being herself, being a regular 24 year old, but also advocating for people. She has now become a huge uh, advocate for mental health and has set this tone for people to realize that it's okay to take a mental health day, that it's okay to say, I just can't do this because I need some time to myself. And so, yeah, I just have mad respect for her as an athlete, as a person. Yeah, I can't say enough good things about her. Yeah. So when it first happened, I, well, first, initially, even before they even got to the Olympics, the pre-qualifier things, you could have seen that she was off if you watched the pre-stuff. So I was just like, hmm, this might be the year she actually loses. So then when she withdrew, I thought it just initially, I thought it was COVID because, you know, still in the pandemic, things like that. And then when she explained the reason why, I understood it. But I felt bad because I was just like, this, because she's so good and she's the greatest of all time and one of the greatest athletes of all time. It's like, hmm, for like her, potentially her career to end like that before I knew she was going to compete one more time on the beam that she did. I was just like, oh, that sucks. But then I was just like, oh, I'm sad for her because, but she did what she had to do. Then when you go through the dark web of the Twitter threads and see everyone calling her a quitter and this and that. And then I just didn't like some of the things they were trying to equal it as like, oh, you don't see U.S. military people quitting if they have like, I was like, okay, those are two completely different things. No one is trying to say that gymnastics is as important as the military or, but everyone's mental health is important. So I just didn't like that. And then seeing people call her a quitter, I was just like, well, I mean, she's technically done more for the country than like most of the people on Twitter because she's there representing the country, putting her body on the line, like you said. So I just didn't get the quitter part. And I still don't get it from today because if you type in, Simone on YouTube or whatever, you'll see things like she quit and why she's an American and why if she knew she had these things, why would she even show up this, this, that. So that argument is just a bad argument for the people who think she quit from a sports side. I, I didn't, I obviously I did not 
I'm not going to say I liked her not being able to compete, but I like seeing what gymnastics was going to be without her because as all goats are, they are not going to do this forever. So we got to see everyone else uh, do it. And also, I honestly think that she inspired the younger generation, like you just said, with like the mental health day and all of that and like taking time for your mental health. And also seeing Suni Lee and the others rise up like, hey, if the GOAT says it's okay to like, I can't do this, can't do this. But also seeing that this gymnastic team is so strong that they can win without her. That would motivate me if I was a women gymnast to like, hey, I want to make this team because we're not just Simone. We are the U.S. women gymnastics national team. But yeah, what you said about the haters and all that, it was just unnecessary. I just didn't think it'd be that hot of topic for two three weeks at the time like i didn't think it'd be that big a deal okay she said she wasn't feeling it twisties all right move on but the fact that millions of people in her own country were calling her a traitor to the nation was just baffling which i forgot who was it rafael rafael nadal who said something about no, Djokovic, Djokovic. Yep. It was, it was Djokovic. Djokovic, yeah. He said something yeah. about uh, Simone, like, oh, you can't do that, blah, blah, blah. Who He was number one tennis player in the world. But then, like, literally, what, two, three weeks later, he had a mental breakdown, and then it wasn't that big of a... Yeah, story. I was, I was going to bring that up. So it actually was at the Olympics. So he, well, and some people say that this quote was previous, so it might have been taken out of context. I don't really know, but basically said pressure is a privilege and she needs to figure out how to, Mm -hmm. you know, compete under pressure, which mind you important to note that she was a victim in the sexual abuse scandal. And she is the only gymnast still competing from that. So you can imagine Mm -hmm. that there is a lot of trauma associated with that going back to the Olympics, knowing that this had happened to you during the Olympics or, you know, during that time frame. So it's understandable that she had, you know, these issues or, you know, mentally she wasn't prepared because how do you deal with trauma? How do you know that that's, you know, going to creep into your mind? Like you just don't know. And, and I think it's unfair p- for people to, you know, discount her trauma and, and that she should be over it by now. You don't get over something like that. And, and so that, that's one thing, but yeah. And so Novak basically was like, pressure is a privilege, blah, blah, blah. And then at the Olympic games, um, he did not have a very good singles showing, um, but was competing in doubles and was supposed to compete in the bronze medal match. But basically it was like, I'm not doing it. Claimed that he was injured, whatever else didn't even try to play in the bronze medal match didn't even give his mixed doubles partner a chance who has never won a medal at the Olympic games to compete. Mm -hmm. And nobody even batted an eye when that happened. So who tell me who is the quitter in that situation? He didn't even try. Simone at least went out there, tried and realized that there were limits to what she could do and how that was going to affect her team. And potentially, you know, she could have killed herself out there. Like, it wasn't worth it, but nobody or very few people were talking about the Novak situation. And it just, it's really frustrating when we look at how athletes are, you know, viewed or, you know, scrutinized just because of who they are or not being scrutinized because of who they are. So yeah, not a great look from him, but not a lot of conversation around what he did which is really frustrating yeah and i also think with the team with someone being supportive of her with the twisties and all that i think also from a normal a normal people's perspective i hope a lot of like employers and all that stuff took example of that because of the highest sports team in the land representing the united states understands that their top employee athlete can't do it and it's like it's okay we've got your back yada 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 normal society and employers should take that into account because on and i get where some people were on twitter saying well my job wouldn't allow me to do that which 
is probably true because they haven't taken mental health serious. And that's a whole other topic for a whole other day because mental health is not even on most people's insurance plans for like work, but they should take note. If the USA national gymnastics team is allowing the greatest of all, like, okay, you're cool. Then your freaking job at like, I don't want to throw any like Best Buy or AEP should allow you to do the same as well. Yeah. And in USA Gymnastics just put way too much on Simone's shoulders. Yeah. You know, they, they basically were like, we've got Simone Biles and that's really all that matters. And, you know, that's a lot of pressure for one person to handle, even mm-hmm. somebody like Simone Biles. So, you know, it's important to recognize that your words matter and what you say and what what you do matters and that can create, you know, problems for people. And obviously USA gymnastics just being their own dumpster fire is a whole different conversation that we could talk about for hours, but you know, what else, what else has been keeping your eyes up at night about like, man, this needs to change for women in sports or honestly, do you feel like last year, this month, but last year, I think in December, that one lady who, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your name, but you had that great, she had a great tweet about being a girl dad and all of that. So now a year later, about to go into 2022, have you felt like when I now talk in the past 40 minutes, it might not be that much improvements, but have you felt like there've been improvements like from last year to this year, as we're going into 2022 and what would you want to see in 2022? Like, how are you feeling about just overall? Well, I think one thing we should talk about is the NCAA expanding the women's Women's, basketball tournament to 68 teams Mm -hmm. and also them being able to use March Madness branding, which Mm -hmm. why they weren't able to prior to that is beyond me. So I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, It's a small gesture. It's the absolute bare minimum that should happen, but I guess we'll take it, which and that's a problem. The fact that I just said that, like, we'll, we'll take, take it. it because we should be expecting more. Those women in those collegiate programs should be expecting more, should be granted more for what they do. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, for me to be like, yeah, this is great. It's it's the bare minimum. It's what should have been happening for the last decade probably or whenever they expanded the men's tournament they should have expanded the women's tournament as well so it's a step in the right direction what they can do more than that you know obviously making sure that we don't have another debacle like we did last march oh man that was some times yeah with the weight room all of that stuff making sure that you know conference commissioners the teams the coaches are doing their due diligence in terms of negotiating or putting that together so that something like that doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. But so that's a good thing. That's a positive, you know, I think there's always going to be room for improvement. You know, we're starting to see more and more women's games on TV, which is massive. Um, But like I said, you can always do more and, and, you know, there's just been a lot of stuff over, you know, the last year and, and we're seeing that the numbers are there. We're seeing that viewership numbers are skyrocketing for women's sports. So why are you not listening to those? Why are you not looking at the data and saying, okay, there's definitely a market for this. How do we, you know, tap into that market and make sure that people know about it? How do we market it appropriately? All of those things. And you're going to get those eyes on the game. Like, do you really need to show a Thursday night game between, I don't even know, some low level conference? Probably not. There's probably a women's basketball game or a volleyball match or something that you can show that people are interested in. For example, Louisville right now, number one team in the country, undefeated. We're going to knock on wood because they play tomorrow, but they have been, so fun to watch but if you don't have the acc network you can't watch watch them them. yeah so like how do we make it more accessible for people so yeah you can say well they're on tv but only a certain number of people can watch that or certain people can watch that so how do we make women's sports 
more accessible. And I think that's something that, you know, networks are going to have to continually improve upon because we know men's sports are accessible. If I went and turned the TV on right now, you know, it's what Tuesday. So there's probably a football game on Uh, Uh, college football playoff. You turn into that, how they make the selection, the final, like the four into a reality TV show. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can do things like that with the women's, um, you know, any sport you can figure it out. So that is something that's always going to need improvement. And I think with basketball in particular, we're starting to see more and more women's games. Um, there was a massive matchup on yesterday between the number one. Yeah. South Carolina. Yeah. And so, you know, it was on at what noon Mm -hmm. yesterday. So how many people are going to be able to watch a noon game? That's, you know, on a Tuesday. Yeah, it's on a Tuesday. They were what in the Bahamas. So time difference. Mm -hmm. You get it. Like there's only so much you can do. But if that was an eight o'clock game, would it have been on ABC or ESPN? Who knows? You would hope so, but you know, there's always something that could bump them from being on, you know, your nationally televised station. So, you know, whatever the networks can do to get people's eyes on them is huge. The other thing is we look at merchandise. We look at different leagues, different organizations selling merchandise, and they don't do a good job of it. Like I have seen people who have wanted like the WNBA hoodies, um, have wanted NWSL jerseys, and they just can't figure out how to have enough stock. So if you're selling out constantly or if things are constantly on back order, wouldn't that in the mind of somebody like Nike or Adidas tell you that you need more inventory? Mm-hmm. The people are clearly interested in buying this stuff, but they can't get their hands on it. Or it's taking, you know, months and months and months to get to people because you just don't have the stock or you don't have the infrastructure to make it happen like you do with men's apparel or with, you know, merchandise for men's teams. Like, why mm-hmm. is that so hard to figure out? So that's kind of my soapbox right now. But, you know, it's it's one of those things that you have a successful model in place. How do you take that model and formulate it to women's sports and make sure that it works for them? Obviously, men's sports, women's sports, very different products, very different fans, generally speaking. So you have to figure out, and this is, you know, what I talk to my marketing students about all the time. You have to understand your consumer. Who is it? What do they want? What are their needs? And then how do you morph your strategy to match those? And like, I I just don't know why that's so hard for execs to figure out when it comes to women's sports. It shouldn't be that hard. You have a model. How do you adapt that model for it to work for women's sports? So definitely some improvement there, but certainly we've made some strides. Um, But Sabrina um in SQ the other day tweeted something about you know I really wish I could go on ESPN's website and see you know highlights from the WNBA WNBA or, oh, or women's man. college they basketball still have, we talked about that last year you yeah. can't even put them on your ticker yeah unless there's something bad happening um mm-hmm. and that happened when the all this stuff with NWSL happened like it's like the only time you people will talk about women's soccer is when there's something bad happening why mm-hmm. can't you talk about it all the time Like, yeah, from a journalistic perspective, you want to talk about things that are happening, but do it when it's positive and when it's negative, not just when it's negative. Like, don't just pick up the story because, you know, people are going to click on it because it's bad or it's not good press. Like, you, I'm sure ESPN has enough soccer writers that could, you know, report on the NWSL regularly or find freelance writers who will do that. So it's it's not that hard, but it's about how much work and time and effort you're willing to put in to make it happen. I agree. Um, it's funny how you brought up number one verse number two and how that was on 12 o'clock um, in the afternoon. But number one and number two in the men's Gonzaga and UCLA, they're playing tonight and it's 10 o'clock. So Western time, like prime time, eight o'clock, they're both on the West. So I understand that. But I think my thing is that if ESPN cares, they will make it happen. Like ESPN never talked about hockey for like the past 12 years. 
unless like Sidney Crosby did something. But now since ESPN has signed the deal with the NHL, now all of a sudden they're they're pro hockey, everything like that. Stephen A. freaking Smith is talking about hockey. The news never talked about hockey in his 20 plus years of like sport journalism. But now since ESPN cares about hockey, everyone cares about hockey. So that's all they have to do, really. It's like, hey, we're going to really emphasize women's college basketball. Then everyone's going to talk about women's college basketball. Still to this day, it's hard, obviously, with like work and all that stuff. But if I'm scrolling through YouTube, looking at ESPN or like Fox Sports and seeing like clips of their debate shows, still have not seen one person even debate like, oh, we just had number one versus number two. The stuff they do with like men's sports all the time, like does this team have are they posed to make a run in the tournament? Because they just beat number two. None of that. So yeah. where they never do the shows like on first take or get up or undisputed. Like, who do you think is going to make it to the final four in women's college basketball? Well, they have like 60 different of those for the guys like every couple of weeks. So there, there's your representation right there for folks if you're not. It's pretty easy to see. Just look at the top. Yeah, side. absolutely. And I think you make a good point about the NHL. Like, it's it's that easy. If you have a TV rights deal, then you have a reason to market. You should be marketing them anyway. But mm-hmm. if you're there's money involved and you're putting forth the effort and the time and the money to have that rights or have those rights, then, yeah, obviously you're going to put forth the effort to make sure that people are watching it. And so why don't we do that for, for women's sports? I don't have an answer, unfortunately, but it is our reality. And then still people are shocked when I tell them that on average, women receive 4% of all media coverage. Like that number has probably grown in the last couple of years, but it's still way below where it should be, especially given how interested people are in women's sports. And that's like people's biggest thing you're like, nobody cares about women's sports. Well, obviously that's not true based on the viewership numbers that we've seen that when games are on CBS or ABC, people are watching them and not just watching them, but are watching them in record numbers. Like that, that should be enough to convince you that you need to put more effort into making that happen. And in fact, I actually just saw that for the first time ever, ABC is going to be, um, doing some gymnastics meets or the in the collegiate final the ncaa final will be on abc which is massive and and so again step in the right direction and i think maybe the olympics definitely helped this because we know that people are really only fans of gymnastics every four years but there is such a huge fandom for collegiate gymnastics and and in particular we're starting to see because of nil so name image likeness that those athletes who go to the Olympics don't have to choose to go pro. They can still go to college because they Mm -hmm. can still reap the benefits of being an Olympian. So you're going to see Jade Carey. You're going to see Suni Lee. You're going to see Grace. They're all going to be collegiate gymnasts this year. And so people are going to watch that. And I think it's really cool that ESPN has, you know, made ABC, um, have some coverage and as well as some of their other ESPN, ESPNU, ESPN2 will have coverage of meets as well. So that's massive. If they want to, they'll make it happen. That's yep. how any that's how any big exec, especially sports, if they care, it'll be done like it sounds it'll be brought to the front of the line, done in two seconds. That's it. It's yep. all it's all it takes from the big execs. Chelsea, anything else before we close closing remarks? Anything? I don't think so. It's just been really good to be back. I know it's been a while, but love talking to you and, and everybody else. Mm-hmm. So uh, first closing thing, obviously, uh, thank you, Dr. Chelsea Police, for being back. Just like you just said, it's been a while. So I know everyone, all the other people, the contributors to the LSMC, your fans are all going to be excited to hear this and see that you are back. Make sure I can't wait as we go into the new year, which means we will be going into March Madness. And I know you will definitely be keeping an eye on the tweets. And I, 
you would think that the NCAA wouldn't mess it up two years in a row, but it is the NCAA. So if they fix that, it'll be something else with travel or something. So definitely keep an eye on that. But no, with that um, being said, it's just great to have you back. Great to have the voice for women's sports on. And yeah, with that being said, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. By the time you listen to this, it will be close to Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving Day or after Thanksgiving. And with that being said, this is the L7C podcast signing out. Thank you for listening to this episode of the L7C podcast. Be sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to the channel. Follow us on all social media platforms, and we'll be talking to you guys soon. Take care.